time in Berlin and then this. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Obviously, we're delighted to see all of you here. And uh, we are super delighted that Tori made herself available for this talk this afternoon. Um, I know that you're actually a private person, so we appreciate But not today. <laughs> not, a, not today, but we appreciate very much that you will share some insights Thank in your you. career and your company. Um, just to mention the location, we are actually in the Tier Anatomischen Theater, which is the animal anatomy lecture hall, and they used to dissect animal corpses there. I assure you, it has nothing to do with our talk today, but um, um, just as context. I feel like I've seen a picture of that. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to give some context. I'm sure there's probably not more than one or two people in the room that don't know Tori, but um, I think it's only fair to mention at least some highlights of her career. And obviously, Tori is the founder of her company. She is the chief creative officer of Tori Birch and the CEO. Tori is the, the mother of three sons. Uh, she also has three stepdaughters. Tori launched her company in 2004, so only 14 years ago. And uh, the collection of Tory Birch obviously spans all categories, from ready-to-wear, accessories, bags, shoes, um, and home decoration and fragrance, so very broad. Tory Birch Company is estimated to have a revenue of $1 billion has uh, 200 stores around the world, obviously is globally present with its digital, and has 3,600 employees today. Tori also launched in 2009 the Tori Birch Foundation, which we will talk in more detail later. And uh, in 2015, Tori Sport was launched, also introducing Tori collections for running, outdoor, um, tennis, and golf. Tori has been the recipient of numerous awards. I just want to mention that she was nominated to the Forbes Most Powerful Women's List in the World and achieved the Sandra Taub Humanitarian Award from the Breast Cancer Research Foundation in the United States. And Tori is also the author of the book, The <laughs> Tori Birch and Color, which I understand was and is on the New York Times bestseller list. And sort of our relationship as my Teresa, we have been carrying and selling proudly Tory Burch since 2011, and we're also proud to launch your Tory Sport collection in 2017. And on the occasion of Tory's visit to Berlin, we are also very proud that Tory collaborated with us as a my Teresa woman. We uh, launched a, a video as part of our series of my Teresa woman, and we are. Super grateful that you agreed to be kind of a spokesperson also for my Teresa. And why don't we start with that video? Because I feel it gives a little bit impression of a, a day in the life of Tori, and then we can start. Well, thank you for all of that. Wow, I'm very humbled. And, and I, I just want to say before the video starts, it's really extraordinary to have partners like you and your entire team. Uh, working with you all for my team is, is really a, a pleasure and, and we're inspired by you and, and the work that we've been able to do, but we look forward to uh, what we're going to do in the future. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I mean, we look forward to tonight also. Yes, that too. <laughs> so may, may we start the video? Our lives are filled with numbers. 187 steps from my apartment to the car. 48 minutes stuck in New York City traffic. Three dogs I'll see downtown. 19 is where I work. 62,000 square feet. 23 working in the atelier. 256 pages in Tory Burch in color. That was what our company feng shui master, Mr. Young, suggested. 62 raw almonds on my desk, but I prefer fries. 15 is the number of times I've lost my glasses. Two iPhones that I carry with me at all times. 12 times my voicemail will be full this week. There are 1,863 sequins in this dress. 93 miles from Southampton. I wish I was there. Six is my favorite number and the number of children I have. 52 family photos around my office. I like this one best. 21 is when my twins find out which one is older actually make it 30. 30,000 Riva Ballet flats sold in our first year. Of course, there is only one Riva in my life. 
<laughs> so obviously this is how it feels and looks today, but maybe we start by um, how it all started. I, I understand you grew up actually in the countryside, yes. on a farm, and you once said that your parents actually have been clear inspirations for you and always have been a support for you to pursue your ambitions. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how they inspired you and how they supported you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think people would be a little surprised if they found out how I grew up. There's so, there, it, I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, and my parents moved out there to focus on family, and I was such a tomboy. I had three brothers, and I was never interested in fashion. My mom was incredibly fashionable, and so was my father, but I was interested in climbing trees and playing tennis and horseback riding, and, and not until maybe my junior year in high school did I think of even putting on a dress, and then all of a sudden I... Uh, was very happy to have a fashionable mom because she really taught me a lot about style and um, what I loved most about her style was that it was so effortless and it was easy and she was obsessed with many designers and um, I would go through pictures of them in the 60s and 70s and up until now of all their travels and that's where my love of art and fashion started but it was a little later, I was probably about 17. And you just mentioned that you grew up with three brothers, yep. and, and I, 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 I read that you actually said that growing up with three brothers made you unaware that girls should do this, boys should do this. I mean, maybe you can Well, we that. were in our own world also. I, one of my brothers called it Andy Warhol meets Tom, Tom Sawyer because we had a mix of characters that were constant in and out of our home, and someone would come and recover for a week and stay six years, and we just had this crazy childhood of just giving to people, and uh, my parents accepted all kinds of people, and it was always a very colorful dinner table. But um, yeah, I never knew a difference in, in gender. There was never a, a time when I thought I couldn't do something that my brothers could do, except when my parents used to have me let my brother win when, he was, when we were having races and, and running, and so I was always very competitive with them. But, I mean, you mentioned that at some stage, sort of the fashion bug started to hit you. So, so when, when, would, when did that happen? At, at, at when you started going to well, university? Yeah. Or when, when, when did you feel, okay, you know, fashion I'm interested, I'm passionate about? Well, it was really at University of Pennsylvania. I, I was an art history major, and I think um, art was something that I thought I would definitely go into. And I, I really um, loved art. I loved fine arts, too. And um, fashion was literally until I was trying to look for a job senior year, and there was a designer named Zorin. Do you know Zorin? He, no. So you have to, everyone has to look up Zorin because he was the original minimalist, and he was from Yugoslavia, which was at the time, um, he told me that's where he grew up, and he looked like Rasputin, and um, his, white, his offices were all white, there were no desks, there were blue mats on the floor and the vodka would start at 10 in the morning. And then all of a sudden, Isabella Rossellini would come, Lauren Hutton would come, Jackie O, Lee Razadwell, all these incredibly stylish women. His clothes were, there was zero hardware, and it was only about beautiful fabrics and drape. And he said everyone knocked him off, everyone from any modern designer. So that was my first job. I called him and I said, my mom wears your clothes, I need to find a job. And he said I could have a job if I started a week after graduation. So I moved to New York, and I had never spent any time in New York. So all of a sudden, I was in New York City. I was a farm girl, as my boys like to call me. And I was in the middle of fashion, and he, he he wanted me to actually cut my hair. He didn't want me to wear heels, no makeup. So it was, it was an experience, to say the very least. That was my introduction. And it didn't deter you? <laughs> not at all, not at all. I actually met um, there Candy Pratt's Price, who started Style.com. And so she hired me from there to go work at Harper's Bazaar. And I showed up for my first job there, and she had left and didn't tell me and went to Vogue. So that was sort of, I was like, what is this industry? But it was, it was wonderful to learn about editors and work with photographers and uh, obviously very low-level assistant. So I um, feel I, I always love each job that I had that I paid my dues a fair amount. 
and, and you love fashion, but you also love the business side of it, right? I learned the business. And from Harper's Bazaar, I worked at Ralph Lauren, and I was the copywriter. And so I was really exposed to every single category, and uh, not glamorous at all. I mean, it sounds, um, well, I'm not sure how glamorous it sounds, but I wrote all the copy, and I learned a lot there. And from there, I, I had actually, Vera Wang used to work at Ralph Lauren. And so before she started her bridal company, and she had started it, and it was probably, she'd gotten a fair amount of traction on her bridal company and asked me to come when she was trying to change into being a ready-to-wear designer. Um, mm. not, not leaving bridal, but really add that. And, and I was 26 years old, I think, and I was running her advertising and public relations and, and trying to think differently of how to really establish her in ready-to-wear. So you had a career in fashion and, and PR and marketing a lot. So, but there's still a big step to say, no, I, I want to have my own company. Yeah. And, and, and I think at that time when you thought about starting your business, you also had your third boy. So, so when was that moment? No, I want my own business. Well, so I went from Vera to Loewe, and it was when Narcissa Rodriguez was designing for Loewe. And I was super excited because I, I was offered to run the American, be president of, a, of the US, and I found that I was pregnant with my third baby. And I realized that having three boys under the age of four and being a president was just not going to work. So I had to make one of those tough decisions that many of my friends and women, I mean, all the time have to face, and I became a stay-at-home mom. And that was heartbreaking on so many levels because I loved my career, but I also knew that I, I needed to be there for my, for my three boys. So it was during that time, that, which was four years of being a stay-at-home mom, that I decided I wanted to start a company I didn't know what, I was, I was actually thinking of a, a school and, and this company at the same time and researching both. Okay. The one thing I knew is that part of the business plan would be to have a foundation. And so in the business plan, already, then. already it was part of the business plan. And, and when I went to do the fundraising, I said, I want to start a global lifestyle brand so I could start a foundation. And, in retrospect, that's a little embarrassing because I had no idea what I was talking about and nor of the amount of work it would take. And this is something I, I, I was wondering. So, I mean, you, you were successful in your career, but then you have to say, oh, I want to start my own brand, three boys. I think from the beginning you wanted also to source from China. So there must have been good advice telling you don't do this, this is crazy. Everyone. So, so why didn't you listen? <laughs> you know, I just sort of, I had an idea, and I, I, what I was missing, and I often talk to our entrepreneurs, is when you're missing something that you can't find, chances are other people can't find it. And it was, the idea was pretty simple. It was beautiful clothes that didn't cost a fortune. And I knew that going to China was the start, but I knew I wanted certain things from India. I knew I wanted certain things from Italy. And, I, I sort of went around thinking, what can I do where? And I also felt that it, based on that and the factories I met with, it sort of turned into the concept of a lifestyle brand. And I also wanted to revive a brand that was in the 60s called Jax, and the designer was Rudy Gernreich. And um, I had cold called the woman who was an entrepreneur, I think she was 90 at the time, and said, I, I wanted to revive your brand. And it was a flat out no. And so then I was sort of sent back to square one and then I just created these image books and pictures and sketches and it just turned into something. But it was a, an iterative process. But you already mentioned tw uh, two things in here. Um, one, that it became a lifestyle brand. I don't want to touch on this in a minute. But also, in the beginning, part of the concept was I may call it accessible luxury. So great clothes, but at a price point. Maybe you can describe that, because that was new and when you started. It, you know, it was something that I, there was either designer and there was The Gap or J. Crew. And I, I, I felt that I love designer, but I couldn't afford to wear designer clothes all the time. And so I wanted to um, find something in between that could always look through a designer lens and be about luxury, but really uh, challenge the factories actually to give give the have the product be the best it can be and the that's that's not easy to design design things at a, a, a more reasonable price point that was that was definitely a challenge 
and, and it was a retail concept and direct to consumer as well. I think that's the second element, which I don't know if you were even aware of the of the level of ambition you started because most designers start with a wholesale brand, but you said yeah. no, it's a retail brand, and not only is it a retail brand, it's across all not all but most of the categories and you already in 2004 started with digital. So, yeah. I mean, you, you had all the elements that many designer brands took years and some not even yet have mastered. So you knew you were what you were doing? You were Well, I didn't know what I was doing. Or, I, 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 mean, this is I, I, I had surrounded myself with very interesting people that had this intellectual curiosity. And I, I, I kept thinking that direct-to-consumer was something I was very interested in in e-commerce. and. Everyone said no one would ever buy online. And if you think about it, it's just 14 years ago. The change of, of what has happened is pretty extraordinary. But um, I knew that it was w one shop in the middle of downtown New York on Elizabeth Street. Uh, there was nothing there except a Cuban restaurant. So the rent was incredibly good. Um, and we opened, and uh, we were told never to have 12 categories, that we should partner with wholesale, as you said. and. Pick a, pick, a, pick a lane, whether it's cashmere sweaters or, or a boot. And so we just did things our, our own way. And I hope today we're still looking at our business that way. That's, I think that's clearly inspirational. Because you, you, you had an idea, you believed in it, and you were not deterred and, and proven right. And not always easy, I can tell you. It's been, I would like to say it's been a journey that is, has been full of uh, all sorts of twists and turns, things that I never imagined happening. Which, okay, fast forward 14 years later, but if you reflect back, what, as an entrepreneur, what have been the biggest challenges on this journey? Wow, I mean, there's so many challenges. Um, great people, I think that's one thing I'm really good at, is surrounding myself with the best people in the world, and I feel so fortunate to have a team that is so extraordinary, and, and that's something that uh, when you think about the macro environment and change, you have to shift a company, and, and it's, it's Herculean to move a company in a different direction. And you know, I think we, we've always built our company in a different way. We never did traditional advertising, so we had to be scrappy. We didn't have a budget, so we were early adapters of everything social. We built it through PR and marketing. Uh, that said, we, we and e-commerce, as you said, but as the world and has been catching up, we also have to move look on. ahead and move on. And so I think the whole concept of reinvention and evolution, but staying true to who you are, is a difficult balance, and it's essential. And, and you mentioned people and, and having people. the best people. So what are you looking for when you hire someone into Tory Burch? What, what makes someone... I think it's no. Well, I think it's interesting. Obviously, talent. That that's that's a given. You have to really respond to what they have to offer from a talent perspective. But I don't think it's the right place for everyone if mm. it's not the right culture for you. And our culture is uh, the backbone of who we are, and it can be affected greatly at times. And so it's a constant work in progress of how do you have an environment that really embraces people, expects great work and accountability, but also is a great place to work. And when you have change, it takes a hit on culture. And so it's not always easy, and certain departments are better off at certain times, and it's a constant check-in. And, and, and listen, the last three years have been an enormous amount of work. You can ask my team in the room if they're still, still walking. It's been um, this time of looking, overturning every rock in our business and investing in our company and the people, most of all, in the product. And it's, it's been a lot of work, but I have to say, then we now see the business and it's starting to really show all the work we've put in. But it's, it takes a hit on culture, so that's one thing. People have to be up for the kind of culture that we have. Um, being agile, that's another, and, and intellectually curious, I, I think is super important when, you're, when I'm talking to someone about the possibility of working with us. And, and I mean, stressed culture, what, what type of culture do you aspire to? As you say, it's a constant working effort, but how would you describe the, the culture that you 
would like to have and, and are striving for at the tour. When, when I sat in my apartment and interviewed people, I used to say, I don't want to have a bitchy fashion environment. <laughs> and I'd been at so many different places, and that was, I'm a very, see, what you see is what you get type of person. I'm not tricky. People, I, I might be too straightforward, very straightforward, but people always know where they stand. Mm. I think that is a very important nuance in our culture. I think accountability is something we're trying to get more infused in our culture because it's a very nice, you have to treat everyone the same. My parents told me you have to treat a cab driver the same as the Queen of England. That's how I was raised. and. Not that I ever met the Queen of England, just as an aside, but <laughs> wishful thinking. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's 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 that type of thing. I guess it all comes down to authenticity, and and that's a really important um, part of our culture. And and it's not always easy. And and I've had 360s, and I said to someone the other day, "Have a 360," because you know, it's it's a rough <laughs> it's a rough <laughs> lesson in looking within. Um, that said, we, we've also done culture surveys, and there's a lot of really valid points, and, and we don't just do them just to do them. We, we want to take action. And this, this journey of 14 years, how, how did it change Tory, the professional Tory? Uh, I mean, you started in your apartment in 2004, today mm -hmm. CEO, chief creative officer. What, how did it change the the Tory, or did it not change? Oh, I, you know, I, I think I'm generally the same person I've always been. My, my best friends are from high school and, and college, and that said, it's changed me a lot. I had to learn on the job. I knew nothing, basically. I didn't know about design. I, I remember Bergdorf Goodman came in the second season, and the, the fabrics were really heavy. I'm like, no, I don't like stretch. <laughs> I don't want any stretch in anything. And he's like, uh, it was it was Josh. I no, it wasn't. I forget who it was. Robert, Robert. Okay. And he said, well, it won't sell. And you know, you have to learn things, technical details, learn how to design, but most importantly, learn how to be a leader and also a business. I had to really work hard at business because that was not my gift, and I had to work hard at the numbers. And it's it's not a natural for me. So that's been a real learning curve over the years. So obviously, it sounds like. A lot of work, a lot of effort. So, how do you and how did you balance work and family? What's the, is there a trick? Was there a trick? I think there's never a trick except I focus on my children first. And I think if I wasn't a great mom, I would never be a great CEO or great at anything. And now my boys are a little older. Older, they're still in high school, and and a couple are in college. Uh, they're sophomores and. I think I'm still focusing on them. They'd like me to let it up a little bit. <laughs> um, but they are, they had my full attention. And, and when I would go home, I would turn it off. And, and, and work was work, and home was home. And, and really, um, that's, family is everything to me. So that had to come first. And so I, I don't think, people always say, how do you have it all? I don't, I don't really understand the concept of that. I think. Everyone has to do things on their own terms mm. and, and the best they can at, and, and what it means to them to be happy. I don't understand the concept of having it all. I think to be a full-time mom and a full-time CEO, I, I don't think it's possible for me. So I had to give and take and, and, and maneuver and also surround myself with a, with a wonderful team where I had trust and, and would let things go um, so I could pick up where my kids needed me. It's amazing. It's inspiring. It's it's hard. It's definitely not easy. There's and no trick. There's no trick. There's no trick. <laughs> I, w I wish there was. I d okay, I have one trick. My mother. So anytime, <laughs> anytime I would go anywhere, my boys would love it because it was a free for all. They would be able to do anything, and then I'd have to <laughs> unwind it and and fix everything when I came back. So clearly, that's a challenge. But you also have an additional challenge because. In, in the business side, you are at the moment CEO and Chief Creative Officer. Yes. So you look after the business, you look after the collection. I mean, many companies, these are two very different, different roles <laughs> and not always fully aligned roles. So you have them in yourself. So how do you? Well, it's very hard and particularly at the size of our company. And it's. Um, I think it's important to understand both, and I think in our company, the creatives and the business side really do work hard at, at finding that balance, and, and it's that nuance that I think 
really helps our business. It's, it's um, something, as I said, that I have to work on. It's not um, something that is just like that. Everyone's like, oh, your company, it happened so quickly. I'm like, wait, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Not this overnight. has been extreme amount of work and so many hours by so many people. Many people here, one, one person's been with me from out of my kitchen. Um, so many people here, I would never be anywhere without them. My brother, who is not here, um, I recruited him three years after the company started. Um, and, and we have a, an, an amazing team. Um, but having the ability to understand the business and, and the creative, I think, has, has worked to our advantage. Um, that said, you never know how long, how long the current situation will last. I want to always be open to new ideas and evolve and, and think about the company in different ways. Um, and I think that's what makes us an interesting company because we are open to different things and new ideas. You, you certainly have done and continue to do so. So, so let's focus on your creative story. Okay. What is your creative process? Is, is, okay, time to design a collection. Is it a team effort? Is it alone? Is it no, it's 100% team effort. And you know, we come up with a concept, like for instance, Fall, it was Lee Razadwell, and she's a woman that is a style icon, Jackie O's sister. And I, I was like, okay, how do I approach Lee? Because she's a friend, and I would never want to interpret her style because she's perfection. And you look at pictures of her, and it's just so inspiring. So. When I asked her if I could do her, her I, I said, I really made it clear. I said, I don't, want to, I don't want you to think this is you going to be walking down the runway because I would never be bold enough or want to try to interpret that in any way. So we thought about different cues and whether it was her pink couch or a print called Happy Times or her structured handbag. And, and it was a really interesting journey of of really her character that was so interesting to me. I love strong women, and when I think about inspiration, we're, and I talked to you a little bit about this, we're so proud to be an American brand, but it's really women globally that inspire me, and, and I think that's what's interesting, is women of all different cultures. And so Lee was very well-traveled. She's visited India, she's American for sure, but I loved her international, um, outlook on life. And so that was something that we tried to infuse, but collaborative. I mean, definitely a team effort. This is many hours of, of working and then pivoting and seeing prints and color and then sketches and design fittings. And it's, it's really the teams all working together. I feel, I feel very lucky to work with the teams that, that we have. So you talked about Fall Winter, uh, obviously, Commercially, we're on a different side. I know, just sorry, I should out, talk about David Hicks. Just bringing out spring summer. <laughs> yeah, so. but David Hicks is spring summer, and actually, um, I've always been inspired by David Hicks. Uh, he was an interior designer that my parents always talked about, and we had books on our table, and I became friends with his son, Ashley, and I called Ashley, and I said, can we do a collaboration on your dad? <laughs> And he's also a designer, so I wanted to tread a little carefully there. And so he gave me these incredible scrapbooks of his father's mm. that his father had meticulous notes, everything detailed of, of interviews, sketches, family pictures, um, interiors of rooms that he hand-colored. Hand and what I thought was, would be so interesting, it's where the original store inspiration came from, and I've always been a fan of geometrics, but again, I didn't want to be too literal, so we challenged our team, and we did this scrapbook print, and it was like taking aspects of every one of the pages of the scrapbook, and Ashley came for a preview, and I showed him the dress, and he's like, well, I really love this dress. It's actually my favorite print. My father would have hated it, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> and he's like, my father would have thought you couldn't make up your mind, and he was so symmetrical, and so perfectly uh, precise, and so it turns out that's my favorite print, and it's actually one of our best-selling prints. So you, you, you actually, it's team effort and beyond your own team so yes. for the inspiration. Yeah, so. beyond, well, and we don't often, we haven't done a lot of collaborations, but I want to do more. It's really a, a nice starting point. So you know that I'm a big fan also of Tory Sports. So Thank you. What, what was the idea behind that, to introduce that 
to the Tory Burch world. So I'd like to say we had great timing, but we, as I mentioned <laughs> to you, have been working on this for seven years. And it was something that was a natural for me. I love sports. I love tennis. I love running. And well, I love walking fast. <laughs> um, but I, what it to me is just such a natural fit for us. And a lot of our team came from just great sport brands like Nike and Adidas. But what I thought would be interesting is how do we design a collection that uh, the function is super functional, but a given, not necessarily a design detail. And how do we think about sport in a concept of the elegance of sport? And sort of, we, we were looking at um, the Royal Tenenbaums as inspiration. We were looking at old pictures on ski slopes of the 30s and 40s, and just the elegance of athletes. And, and that's something that I think sets us a bit apart from what's happening in the sport market today and, and the femininity. And so we launched two years ago and we're super excited to partner with you. And, and we've had a lot of amazing traction. I mean, as a company, one thing that I've been careful of from a CEO standpoint is careful growth. And we, we, we've grown quickly, but carefully. And so we, we, we want the right kind of growth. We're focused on full price selling and healthy growth and really partnering deep in deep ways with, with wonderful partners like you and, and we want it to be inspiring or it, it doesn't make sense for us. I didn't know about Royal Tenenbaums. You I, didn't know that? No. Now I have a picture of a red tracksuit because that was always in a Royal Tenenbaums. Well, it's really funny because Gwyneth Paltrow is a friend and she was on a late night show and she was wearing the headband and one of our tracksuits. So it was actually perfect. It was, um, but that movie you have to see again. <laughs> I will after today. It's, yeah. <laughs> Let's move to, on to another big chapter, which is the foundation. And, 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 and you already mentioned that it was part of the plan from the beginning, which is, is, is astounding and very brave. But um, you've been proven around, right. So um, again, to those people who, who are not as familiar with the foundation, so as I said, it was launched in 2009. It, the, the, the mission is to empower women entrepreneurs um, by providing access to capital. Um, education, um, digital resources, so again, the element of digital. Um, and just to give context to, to the audience, um, you, the foundation has distributed so far $36 million to more than 1,700 women entrepreneurs. Um, more than 170 women have completed an in-depth business education, and that part you actually partnered with Goldman Sachs, as I understand. And, uh, and, and the reach you have is, 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 is amazing. So more than 200,000 women had access to online tools, digital education uh, through your digital resources. And uh, more than 10,000 have created a business plan on ToriBirchFoundation.org, which is, 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 is unbelievable. And you have received so much support for this. Um, and it doesn't have to be a celebrity, but it is impressive when you hear about how many celebrities have joined your cause and have really joined to um, take a digital pledge to embrace ambition. And I want to talk to you about it, but I think first we show the video oh, okay. to give context, and then um, I want to hear more about Thank the you. program's initiative. So I hope the sun allows. To I'm ambitious. I will not hide it. We will not hide it. We embrace ambition. Women are made to be ambitious. I will dream big. Big. Without hesitation. We will take risks. Not live in fear. We will rise together. Rise above the negativity. No longer will ambition in a woman be, be seen, seen as, as a negative. negative. Be persistent. Don't apologize. Never give up on your goals and dreams. We will model ambition for our daughters. And our sons. I will help women around the world. The whole world. To succeed. You have to persevere. Women are tough. Strong. Powerful. We have got to be a part of this conversation. Ambition is feminine. Ambition is empowering. Ambition is not a dirty word. I can think of a lot of dirty words. Ambition's not one of them. Ambition is sexy. Ambition is very sexy. What's your ambition? To help women build empires. Help more women run for office. Empower women financially. Help women entrepreneurs. Create powerful images. Change people's lives. Fight gender stereotypes. Equality for all. 
call for all of us to lean in together. To transform societies. Change the world. Take the stigma out of the word ambition. Own your power. Own your power. Own your drive. Own your dreams. Own your dreams. No judgments. No judgments. We own it. Take the pledge. Take the pledge. Take the pledge. Embrace ambition. Embrace ambition. Will you? So tell us a bit more about the programs, the initiatives. Yeah, no, well, I want to um, first say thank you. That's amazing. Um, Bank of America is our partner that um, has helped us given out the, the close to $40 million of, of low interest capital. And it's in the US for now. One day, we would like it to be international. That's a dream. Um, but I, I have to say to meet the entrepreneurs that we're working with is incredibly inspiring and humbling. And great business minds, often single moms, uh, have two jobs sometimes. And what they're able to accomplish is, is extraordinary. Um, so to be able to work with them is a gift. When I went to uh, fundraise for our company early on, a lot of the men I met with said to me never to say social responsibility and business in the same sentence. And it was like a pat on the back, like charity work. And it just really, I think, well, not incited, but it just made me more determined to show them that business and social responsibility should go hand in hand. And fast forward 13 years, at Christmas, I, I came from a conference, and it was a conference that time and fortune put on. And the whole concept was doing good is good business. And so I called our partner and I said, Len, you know, I shouldn't say his name. I said, Len, um, it's really funny. I remember a conversation we had about 12 and a half years ago. And I said, you looked at me and you basically ridiculed me for saying that uh, social responsibility in business should really be kept in separate separate fields. And he goes, what do you want? And I said, <laughs> and I said well, of course I want a check for the foundation, Len. And so he writes a very generous check. And he said, this is the one time. And I said, yes, of course, till next year. Thank you so much. <laughs> but it was just, you know, so gratifying to see the sea change that's happening in business. And companies today need to have purpose. And that's something that um, we've been preaching about, women's issues. I'm so happy it's the forefront of people's minds. It's something we've been talking about for 13 years. We have so far to go. Um, when you look at, in the United States, women are making 70 cents on the dollar of a man. I'm sure if we look everywhere around the world, it's at least that. And so many more issues than pay and equity. So if I can be uh, move the needle in a small way and, and help other CEOs look at their sales force and, and give women equal opportunities in every way and, and promote diversity, promote inclusion. Um, that's something I'm determined to do and also use our company as a platform to do. So that's, that's really been a wonderful thing. And, and really, it's, it's a fine balance. As you can imagine, the US is, is a pretty chaotic place at the moment. And when I think about weighing in on issues, I try to make it, and we talked a bit about it, not be about politics, because I, I think you don't win with that. But I do weigh in on humanity issues. And, I, and that's something I'm proud to say. Um, there are certain people that I'm very proud not to have in our clothing if they feel a certain way. So I don't mind, as a leader in business, to really make very strong statements about people that aren't inclusive, people that don't treat people with dignity and respect. And that's something that I hope will continue to really promote. And, and having partners like Bank of America, where we're, we're averaging a million dollars a month to get out to women that really pay back their loans at a 98% rate. Mm. They're investing in their families and communities. They're incredible business leaders. They're collaborative. If we can, if we can push the needle there and if we can educate more women and in these mini business schools that we do with Goldman Sachs and then we have a fellowship program, it will be very exciting. And, and what I didn't realize is how great it is for the bottom line of our business. And that's something that is a, a wonderful added bo bonus. It's, it's having people want to work at our company. It's great for our employees, but it's also great for our customers because they know, and, and certainly millennials care about this, but I think all people care about this. Um, we we want to do good. And, and I think one of the most important things 
that we're doing on April 24th is the Embrace Ambition Summit. It's a 2.0 of that. And that video reached 192 countries. So we knew we touched a chord with that. But the summit, I think, is so important because it's a summit for women and men. And I think if we're talking to ourselves, we're never going to get anywhere. I think all the women in this room would agree. We all want women to be treated equally, but we need men to come along and really join this as part of humanity. And it should not be a favor, it should be a given. And I think you're having a little girl, and, and as a father, when I talk to fathers, that's, that's very, it's a very eager audience to listen. That's the angle. That's the angle. That's my angle. <laughs> no, I said to you last night, not as much men about their wives. Sadly, it's more about their little girls. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get men and their wives, too. So when, when, when you reflect on your entrepreneurship, what is the biggest obstacle to women entrepreneurs that you try to solve for? Is it access to capital? Yeah, is it's, it networking? Or it's all of the above. Access to capital and I think low interest rates are really the key because a lot of times the interest is what puts women into debt. In the U.S., actually having a baby is what puts, it, it, it puts women under the poverty line. And mm. so there's ways that if we can help with access to capital, networking, uh, mentoring, and if we can create this community, which we, we now have started to do, I should say that it, it really hasn't been an external conversation um, at all because we never wanted it to be perceived as marketing in any way. So we were very careful until we had real impact and scale. And it's taken us a while. It, it's really only happened in the last three years that we feel that we can really externally get this message out. So It's amazing. This is amazing. Thank you Fantastic. very much. I have to check on time <laughs> because my, my team is very strict. Um, <laughs> you can't imagine. Um, but, of course, we also want to know future plans. Yeah. What's happening? Where is Tory Burch, the company, the brand, in five years' time? Or what are you aspiring uh, well, to? Well, I mean, I take one, one day at a time. We, we definitely have plans. But again, it's looking at Europe differently. How do we um, get really our brand uh, thinking about different places in Europe? It's a super exciting opportunity. Um, opportunity in the Middle East, in China. Um, but again, it's like, how do we grow in an organic way? And, and to me, the work we put into our product is something I'm most proud of. And I think you can be as operationally excellent as any, any company, but if you don't have the right product, it doesn't really matter. Sure. So we have to really always be product driven and customer driven. And so I, very focused on how do we how do we really, oops, sorry, how do we appreciate our customer? How do we really uh, celebrate them? Because in many ways, they help build our brand. And that's something that is very exciting to me. Through all the social media and all of, all of the interaction we've had with them, they do feel ownership. And the other exciting thing, after we've gotten a lot of analytics, is that our customer is all ages. And so we have a younger customer. We have the, a working woman. We have a mom. It's all different kinds of women. And, and that's something that's inspiring to me and our team. So how do we, how do we get the message out in a more broad way with our foundation in a five-year plan? I would love to be international. I, I want to be careful saying that because I hope it, I really want it to happen. Um, so we have to figure out how we do that. And, and um, I think our, our foundation site is a good start. Um, and we're very, we've done a lot of work on that and um, the tools that women have that are available to them just by going on the site is very important. But how do we build the company and in tandem with the foundation? And, and, and really, it's a global company, but make it even more global and um, focus on product. Edit. Less is more. Less product, but product with more integrity. <laughs> Every, edit in every way. I'm not sure how you look at your company, but it's all about editing. It, it, it is, because, I mean, the world has been is so connected today, but that means everything is available to everybody, and it turns into nothing. Because yeah. it's so confusing. You have to have an individual company. point of view. So true, so true. So I would summarize, there's still a lot for the oh, next five yeah. years. Oh, yeah. I still feel like we have so much to do. So. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. I think me. we still have time for a few <laughs> Q&As. <but laughs> Thanks so much.
much. I think it's great. Um, it's now time for a couple of questions. It would be great if you just raise your hand and then basically I select you. Let's just start. Uh, well, okay, so um, I think you have to, I, I like designing for women because I'm um, always interested in having the clothes enhance a woman rather than, my mother always said, don't ever let the clothes wear you, you have to always be the star. And I think there's something really interesting about that. And I think my philosophy has changed as I've learned how to be a designer, but I'm really interested in the concept of restraint and, and how do you have the right details, the, the perfect fit and quality, but it has to be um, not overdone. And that's something that I'm really interested in as, as we move forward even more. Well. Well, so I'm an incredibly shy person, and I have a shy little boy, and it's so funny how history repeats itself, because I hear my mother, my last name was Robinson growing up, and I would cling to her leg and never let go, and um, I would never want to engage with people, and certainly have a talk like this was out of the question, so overcoming um, being open to putting myself out there in a way that I felt comfortable with has been a, a real challenge. And how do you represent a company but also maintain a level of privacy? It's been that balance. And really pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I've always really tried to do that. And I keep hearing in the back a voice saying, you're Tori Robinson, don't you know? Everyone feels the exact same way you do. So, now I'm saying it to my son. I would say, first of all, have a unique point of view and just do your own thing um, and, and, and take risk, but careful, measured risk and, and be prepared for a ton of hard work. But it's also a joy to be in our industry. I feel it's a wonderful industry. It's just, it's hard work and there's no, there's no getting around it. And I, my, I did a speech at Babson University for their graduation and my whole speech was there's no such thing as an overnight success. And I truly believe that. People like to think it happened like that, but it's all the millions of hours <laughs> that people don't see. But it's, uh, yeah, have your own point of view. I think um, when, when people get referential, that's, that's where it's, it's hard in our industry. And certainly, you know, we try never to do that. And, and certain things slip through the cracks. And it's like, whoa, we can never be referential. We have to really push ourselves to be creative on our own terms and, and think about who we are um, as individuals and individual thinking. Sure. One, one last question. I think I probably have them all the time, but I have to say, it's such an iterative process that it's not like all of a sudden we have a collection and here it's done and we have to do it and it's like a, a writer we have, well, we definitely have deadlines and that's very strict, but sometimes you just have to let it go and get a good night's sleep and then start again because it is impossible if you have to do something and it has to be done and it has to look a certain way. And I'm definitely a perfectionist, so for me it's a constant uh, work in progress until that affects the business, and then you have to just stop and let it go. Thanks so, so. much. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.